So I am very glad to be here and uh, glad to uh, speak to scholars and would-be scholars, those who are in a PG program. And uh, I don't know how many of you will go to a PhD, decide to do PhD and uh, pursue research. So this presentation we came up with um, after some discussion so that uh, the uh, current social science students, scholars, could benefit from this talk. Okay. Um, traditionally, little, little bit, you know, I briefly I need to tell a couple of things. So I did my undergraduate from Usman University, and uh, which is in social work. Then went to Delhi to do my MA, MSW it is called, and some places it's called MASW, and uh, MPhil. And then came back to teach at uh, College of Social Work, and then at that time I started doing my PhD while working as a lecturer. So it was not that easy. It's a part-time student doing PhD. Uh, so what it requires is, it doesn't come that easily. I worked here as a faculty for about 10-11 uh, years uh, within the Usman University uh, colleges and then went to US because my hungry for knowledge did not um, satisfy me and uh, led me to be complacent with what I have accomplished. Okay. I wanted to do more, so that's what uh, made me to decide to go for go to US. So, right from the days of my student days, learning is something which I enjoyed always. I want to learn more. I want to have more knowledge about the things that I am studying and also about what I can do, contribute. So, at a fairly, fairly early in my education, I was impressed with uh, education and I wanted to become a lecturer. That was my goal. When I was in a fairly in undergraduate in, uh, degree, so I thought it was better to become a lecturer. Then I never changed my goal. Even when I went to US, and there are a lot of people who went to US, they did social work degree, they did other degrees, but all of them ended up in computer computer jobs. I am one of those professionals. I don't have to do that because I got a job again, a social work job in the US as a faculty. But it didn't take that long. One one hour, one one year, roughly about one year. In a one year's time, I found a, a faculty job and I became assistant professor there. And. Why I ended up becoming an associate professor? Because the work that I did here in India. I was not only teaching, but I was also practicing, leading an NGO here and working with other NGOs here. And different works, different projects we were designing and doing research for them. So, I'm involved in a slum improvement projects in Vijayawada, in Hyderabad, and rural development projects. We went through all the trainings, etc. So those kinds of the foundation that I had was huge, apart from education from Usman University. Of course, I had a good mentor, PhD mentor, Professor Lal Das, who uh, retired recently, but I met him during my visit while receiving a lifetime achievement award from a National Association of Professional Social Workers was very significant because I'm receiving from my own uh, place and a lot of people who whom I met there was uh, really uh, delighting and my professor was also there and my scholar was also there at the room, that room at that event. So it's a really uh, a, a, a very satisfying, very gratifying. So why I mentioned this uh, uh, trajectory of my career is so things done, did not come so easily. So when I mentioned that I went through this process, did it happen so easily? No. And did it come naturally to me? No. 
But what it took? It took a lot of hard work. As I mentioned earlier, I am a very passionate student. I want to learn. At least that motivation was there. But when you do systematically what you can, what you can accomplish, when you systematically work for your career, I said an undergraduate degree itself, I had a goal to become a lecturer. And I became. And I wanted to go to US. But it did not let me go out of academics again. I continued in academics. So it happened because I worked consistently to build my skills. So I was able to compete the very best from the US universities as a faculty member, and one of the awards that I received was the Gerontological Society of America. I competed the very best in the US. Bethel Usman University degree. There used to be people, you know, have a very low opinion about Usman degree. It is a degree. So it is the work that I do matters. Okay. So we bring the name to Usman University by our work about our contributions, okay? So, it is you, you who will make the difference. Bring the name to the university. Of course, the university name also matters. <clears throat> Even in India, when I was working with the War Academy of Human Resource Development, there were colleagues who were uh, from IAM and IAMs. They thought uh, ordinary university degree is less valuable PhD than IAM PhD fellowship. Even here in India, why go that far in years? Even in India, people were thinking uh, a PhD from uh, ordinary university is lesser value compared to the other. So, all these challenges I had to face systematically to work on that to prove myself that I am a competitive candidate in everything that I was doing. So, this comes only through your work. University can do certain things, a professors can do certain things, but a lot of it is you as a student. How you apply that knowledge, how, do you, how you develop yourself and the practicing that makes all the difference. Okay? So let me get into the topic here. Um, the, the context of, that I'm going to talk about is uh, Social science research in general and behavioral science, which you go, some of the disciplines are focusing on the human behavior, so they are called the behavioral sciences. And in, ger in general, social term, social sciences is a broad term that covers a lot of disciplines which deal with the social phenomena. So, deal with the social problems, or societal issues, or societal concerns, all that. So, historically, social and uh, behavioral sciences started growing with the industrialization, urbanization, and the people started studying their issues, concerns, etc. The discipline started growing. If you look into the history of the, all the social sciences, and further bifurcation also happened due to that. So mostly 19th century to 20th century, and these are the beginnings, you know, some disciplines, mostly economy used to dominate, and political science used to dominate, but a lot of disciplines, sociology, and a lot of disciplines bifurcated. Just like biology is one subject, but there are a lot of this now specializations that have emerged. And social work is one of them. It is applied social science in a way. So we draw heavily from sociology, psychology, economics, political science, public administration, all that, you know, applied to human problems, how we can solve human problems, human issues of societal problems. So it emerged as a profession. There are a lot of professions that have emerged out of the applications of social sciences to human problems, human and societal problems. We try to solve them, address them. In the process, this, this specialized knowledge areas emerge, and that becomes disciplines and departments eventually. So we can trace in a Western world. This is the uh, these are the roots of uh, social sciences. But in Indian case, it is a different situation. And if you look into the social sciences, you have a Vedic literature. And there are social aspects and a lot of uh, things are covered in the Vedic literature. And Kautilya's work, it's a, most people know it is economics, most of it, but there are a lot of more than economics he talked about. 
And there is social and behavioral science as well in that. And a lot of policies. How the administrators should work and welfare and all that we are talking about these days now. Uh, governments, what they should be doing and what they should not be doing. A lot of discussions about what are the right policies, what are wrong policies and all that. He elaborated a lot of them. And if our, our people, you know, administrate the political uh, uh, leaders, need to be trained in uh, what are some of these uh, uh, rules. They need education and training. Because no qualification for that. At least now once they get elected, they need to be training. We used to train uh, grassroots level leaders uh, when they are, get elected to the panchayat. Panchayats, but I think that some of the leaders also need, you know, they also need the training. They need to know what they are supposed to do. So, in a in, a, in our subcontinent, a lot of writings of Kautilya are very valuable, and that also provides some foundations for social science. So, we, we I don't know how far we go and discuss this, and from the social science perspective. And a lot of research can be done, and that we should be looking at our own literature as well, apart from in, in addition to social science from Western world. So, in a decent, there was a decent place on respect for social sciences in India because a lot of foreign scholars came to India and studied at these universities. Okay, so I don't have to emphasize that. But uh, now, many science and technology institutions in India, they are on par with uh, Western universities. On par. If you take IAMs and MIT, they are almost on par. IITs, MITs, these are the institutions that are global institutions. The global companies come here, they put the candidates. Because they find that this talent uh, good talent here, they have the people. They pay good salaries. MNCs, a lot of MNCs come in high. Why? Because they are competitive. The kind of very talented people go to IAMs with a lot of skills. They are on par with. Whereas social sciences are concerned, we are not on par. In a sense, I am not saying social sciences are inferior here. Why they are on par? There is a lot of exchange that is taking place. Typical sciences, science, technology, there is a lot of exchange of knowledge, exchange of ideas, interactions, all that is happening. Whereas social science is very, very limited. And this is, I am learning why this is happening. We should also interact at the same level so that you know, what, what is good here can be learned by the Westerners and the US and what is good over there can also be learned here. Because we are not interacting so intensively, uh, regularly, so we are missing. So we don't know what is happening in the U.S. and uh, you are not learning about it. And also the U.S. does not know some of the good things that we have here. Lot of good material, lot of evidence. Nobody cared, nobody looked at it. Nobody digged out and built any theories, any science out of it. So we have so much of knowledge in India. Through the work, there were a lot of good projects that have been done, which are addressing the human problems and societal problems, and our climate and all that. But they are, they are not documented. The science is not built out of the practice. So they are just practice. So the people are generations after generations, they are doing the work, but nobody is building the knowledge out of it. We have to systematize the knowledge, body of knowledge that can be applied to human problems and solve the problems, and societal problems, and improve the quality of life. And how do you apply social sciences? A lot of social sciences can be built, Indian social sciences can be built, and that will be useful not only for India, but also for Western world. But that rigorous social science research needs to happen. And you are the scholars. You are the future of the country. And social science is not uh, less valuable. Social science is very prominent now in the US. We participate on uh, uh, medical research 
we participate on interdisciplinary research. And we contribute with our social sciences how things work at a community level. We can't, I contribute on some of the projects. And how things can be implemented. And we are talking about social determinants of health. A lot of sociology, a lot of psychology, social work, application. So we are writing grants, we are writing uh, articles, we are publishing. If you, any of, any of you are reading any journals published by US, some of the journals, you will see that in your own field. What kind of research is happening and what they are doing, <coughs> what they are publishing and all that. So you can trace what is going on if you are a systematic reader. I used to read one journal which is available only to Usman University when I was a PhD student, Human Relations, that used to be published in London, uh, in London but University College of Business had the, that journal. And I read so many of those backdated, almost like a 10 years literature I was reading. So th that provided a lot of input and I scanned through a lot of organizational theories because of that journal. So, so Western, whereas Western societies, these sciences are being recognized, respected. Whereas we are thinking the social sciences, anybody can learn without training and not much knowledge and easily we can pass. No, that's not correct. There is a systematic body of knowledge that you have to acquire and then the acquisition of knowledge is not enough. How you apply to the human and societal problems. That's what will make you a different scholar and also practitioner and you will gain skills out of it. If I simply uh, gain the degrees and I have not went out into the society to apply it, to do research, then I would not have transformed myself as a researcher or scholar. Because I was going full cycle of learning and applying and relearning. So continuously that was happening. You, are, you acquired a degree, you are applying it to the human problems, societal problems, and then you are learning from it, from your own research, and then going back and applying it. This cycle goes on, on and on. What happens? You are growing as a professional. You are growing as a scholar. You are trying to become something. So your growth never stops. When you are growing as a scholar, and there are always good prospects for you. If not one place, the other place. Because someone is going to recognize you. When I went and faced the interview in the US, and a lot of 12 candidates competed, competed for the position, faculty position, and I was picked. I was even coming from outside, outside, so why? Because I was able to answer their questions and applications, was the thing. How I can transfer the knowledge that I am bringing from India, how I can apply in a year society? If I do not know the application of it, I would not have been hired. And why I was successful? Because I was a continuous learner. I was going cycle after cycle to learn and apply the knowledge. So social sciences, if you start applying, you will improve your own life first of all. You will improve your own standards. You will improve your own confidence, your competence. And then you will also start contributing to the society. And you will be, you will be at a point where you will your contributions will be recognized. So that's what happened when I received my Lifetime Achievement Award. My contributions are recognized by my professional community, my peers. Your contributions are very valuable. Though you are living in the US, but you are still contributing here. You are making a difference, and not only in India and uh, abroad. So they, that's what made them to decide to award that, uh, give that uh, award. So what I am saying is, if you start thinking about transforming yourself, you will end up transforming your own community and society. 
one day that that day will happen because you are a learner you are a scholar you are building your skills you will see your day of peakness peak one day you will reach the everest if you start climbing each day you know trekking learning and you know, how to do that okay so what is happening in us is a uh, lot of interdisciplinary research is taking place so traditionally when the interdisciplinary research is started the natural sciences the typical sciences they were collaborating so say for example if there is a cancer they are trying to address the problem and find new treatments and all that so which are the disciplines basically tried biology okay and medical physiology and some of the medical disciplines so these are the closely related disciplines they were collaborating and trying to find solutions okay that was the approach so traditionally they are sister disciplines and they are collaborating and trying to do research but do you know where we are in the us in terms of interdisciplinary research we are including social science including social sciences and one of the projects and a cancer research i am part of the project i am one of the mp we have a, a, a mechanism called mpp mpi multi principal investigator means there are more than one principal investigator lead researcher more than one lead researcher that means there are multiple people lead researcher so i am one of the npi means i am social science lead researcher so i am equal in terms of the either research team so we are working together to explore how we can address cancer okay treatment level so they are providing the treatments but they are not working effectively i am adding my disciplinary background social and behavioral science background to address the problem what we can bring to the table to address doing research how biomarkers are working and how environmental factors are working there is a there is there is a thinking that so bio biology will determine everything it has been the dominant thinking that uh, our dna or the genetics will determine the outcomes whether you get cancer or not it's a genes which will decide and which is by birth you get no by birth you get your genes and you cannot change them dominant thinking uh, was in the past that once you have a uh, uh, the genes that are uh, prone to any disease you cannot do anything so cancer uh, diabetes and there are some genetic diseases related to but that thinking is no longer valid now we are thinking with improvements in the environment with changes in life lifestyle you can influence the make influences on the cellular level so the changes that have occurred at the genetic level if you are influencing the cellular level when where you are altering the hormones and the body uh, chemicals so you are in injecting more positive uh, hormones and inputs into your body system you are able to impact cells and internal systems so the internal systems can alter the response to the disease response to the disease your ability to immunity will increase with the positive orientation lifestyle and all that so what have, and also improving the environment so these can if not prevent the problem it will minimize the problem if not completely solve the problem positive at least minimizing and controlling mediating it. so something is better than nothing but if you systematically alter it provide the intervention 
it can bring different outcomes. And even now the research is using placebo. Means even there is no intervention at all, there is no treatment at all. It is just you are told that you are getting the treatment, you will be all right. That is what is the placebo is. And there are randomized control studies. If you know, randomized control studies are the highest level of studies that are conducted. You create two groups of uh, population. One is getting the treatment, means intervention. The other is not getting the intervention. Whether the intervention is effective or not, you will be finding out. This is the highest level of research, science, producing the science. And where they have found in an randomized control studies that the placebo is working. Even the groups that are receiving the placebo are improving in their condition. Then how? That is one of the research questions, research questions always we have in a research. So there is an environmental effect and other effects, but it's a randomized control studies. It is a limited because they are matched and they are randomized and a treatment is provided. So there are more rigorous studies that are conducted and more than one study conducted. So we, it is proved that placebo can affect them. The positive ideas, positive thinking can make a difference and having the belief that you will be all right. You will be all right with the treatment. So having that belief, can self-belief can change the things. But if you think that you can, you will be all right, you will achieve what you want to achieve in your life. If you start believing it, you will achieve it one day. Because all your body system will respond to that, that belief. So this, this is, people have a ridiculed the belief system. But belief system is working positively. If it is used positively, it will help the people. And in social science, we are calling a strength perspective. If you're having a belief and the person can follow you, that, that can improve the things. So social scientists have come to play a variety of roles in the health sciences, improving all that. You know, what, what is listed there, increasing the sensitivity to demographic imperatives, prospecting investigation, social experimentation, growing appreciation, and even understanding the complex real life trajectories. So let, let me move on to the slide and I will be talking more in terms of uh, how methods can be used. So social sciences are valuable to the study of human behavior and organization. Since they aim at clarifying human and behavioral realities, they can improve human condition. So we are applying social and behavioral sciences to improve the field. So it is to fight the disease, compute, communicate, and uh, uh, even social and political problems are most significant and urgent. Sociological research can help solve the problems. Unfortunately, not all programs work, but social science scientists try to change the world, and they provide information about the existing problems and encourage people to suggest possible solutions. This is a, uh, a, a quote, you know, the PowerPoint is shared, you can read more, which is taken from the, an article. Okay, let me come to social determinants of health, where you see the interactions and intersections of sciences. So, you see well, how, what are the problems that are existing, key dimensions of those problems. Uh, here you see the context, in a, in a globalization environment, micro level, macro level, meso level, and then you see key dimensions and directions for the policy. Um, and what are the issues that are being targeted at the end, taxes, paid family, medical leave, etc. So these are the things that could affect the person's health, well-being, and outcomes. So, if if we are trying to help uh, uh, people with uh, without medical insurance there in the U.S. or who are living in poverty or lower incomes, and they are going to have a poor health outcomes. The disparities we use a term called health disparities. Those who have higher incomes, those who have less incomes, the outcomes are different from that. Means, those who have less incomes have more health problems, more health issues they face. And even in terms of some of the uh, chronic conditions, they face worse situations. So there are differential outcomes, health outcomes for the people, those who have different differential incomes. In the same way, poverty, and also the family background. 
So in the US, you have one of the trends is uh, here we have two parent families mostly. In the US, you have single parent families also. A good percentage of families are single parent. If there is a trend here in also in, the, in India now, there are uh, one parent is uh, managing the family and all that. But it is uh, more prominent there, you know, at least now 10% or 50% of them still live alone with the children, either male or female, more female. But uh, so they have a lot of disadvantage in uh, facing uh, in, the, in terms of health outcomes and also poverty, living more likely to live in poverty because of one income. And also, um, if anybody is sick and the mother, mother or father cannot go to work, they have to take care of it. So they lose income very often when the children get sick and are trying to address these children issues. So the health outcomes are very poor. And here, what are the disciplines that can be brought together? So we have sociologists working on health determinants, psychologists working, social workers working, economists also are helping. What are the health care costs? How can you control? And a policy, social policy. So of course, the uh, political science as well as a lot of disciplines also focus on social policy, how, what kind of policies are good. So it is interdisciplinary. And public health professionals also join in that race. And medical professionals are also. So see the, if we have any, any interdisciplinary project, there are at least now 8 to 10 disciplines that are part of the project. Sometimes our list of investigators is one page, one full page. And we define everyone's role very clearly, what each one will be contributing. So because they are bringing unique expertise to contribute to that research. And we meet often discuss the common meetings. It is not um, a, a one discipline is more valuable than the other. So everybody will listen to every, everyone's discussion and we share the project proposals and everyone will, will lead, provide their input. Even the technical stuff, you know, that they, my biologists and medical professionals write, we also read, provide the feedback. And we are expected to write uh, not using the jargon. Mostly research proposals are expected uh, and if you use a lot of jargon, it is a disadvantage. You will not score more on that. You, may, you are less likely to receive funding. You have to use less jargon in your research uh, proposals. Then only you receive funding. So means other disciplines, uh, disciplinary experts can understand the research pro proposals, except for some of the technical terms where you may have to um, uh, seek guidance from your colleagues to understand it. But it is promoting more uh, science, working together, promoting uh, interdisciplinary teams, transdisciplinary teams. Some of these are few research, some of, the, some of them are focusing on practice, how to help and all that. Okay, see here the disciplines, what we will do strategies to address the health disparities and equity, uh, policy and law, infrastructure and capacity building at the community level, and then data and surveillance. We collect the systematic data over a period of time, it's not just uh, one project, some of the projects are longitudinal. You collect, wave, collect waves of data. You go beyond uh, decades. No? There are some studies conducted, uh, data are collected every decade. Since the 60s you have data. And some researchers just focus on the, uh, the data that is available. And that itself requires a lot of skill. You have to be trained how to use that data. There is a way it is that these data bases are managed by either by the universities or independent uh, units that are established. And researchers will make a request, this is the data I want because I am proposing to uh, conduct my research, so these are my hypothesis, when you share that information, the people will uh, provide you that, uh, that amount of information to you and you conduct your own analysis and all that. The data, basically, basically SPSS file will be provided to you, Excel file, whatever it is, and then you do your own analysis to test your hypothesis. But you have to provide very basic information. For that also, you need to have an institutional approval, for, even for that research. So research standards are enforced even for a secondary research. Okay, 
Okay, let me clarify a research definition. I don't know how many of you, we use a research term very loosely sometimes, but there is a, a, a definition that needs to be really, uh, the definition should be met when you write a research proposal. So research is defined as a creation of new knowledge and or use of existing knowledge in a new and creative way. So there is something new you, that you are doing. It's not just repeating what somebody else has done. No, no value to it. It's not research. Creative is has to generate new concepts, methodologies, understandings. And this could include synthesis and analysis of previous research to the extent that it leads to new and creative outcomes. So when you are proposing a research, uh, proposing a research, you should be accomplishing this. If you are not doing this, it is not research. Something new you are adding, there is a value addition through your research. Otherwise it is not a research, just repeating what somebody else has done. What is that new thing that you can bring out through your research? You may use some of the frameworks of previous researchers, but you will be adding. So research is seen as a social investment. Though you are funding your own research, your own personal research, but research is seen as a social investment. Society is investing. So can you collect the data without the cooperation of the community or the participants, research participants? You need that. And if you are getting fellowship, who is funding? The public funding, tax money. You have to be responsible what you will be contributing. There is social investment. And there are professors who are giving a lot of time to guide you, mentor you and all that. Who is paying for them? Society is paying for them. Social investment. There is a lot of social investment in producing a PhD. Okay? Even if you are doing for your own interest, you want to have a degree, but there is social investment. Therefore, there should be a social contribution. Since there is a social investment, through your research, there should be a social contribution. Something, some benefit the society should derive from your research. If you change your mindset, you are not doing this research just to satisfy your aspiration and something should come out of your research then there will be this different research that you will do my research should solve address some problem and find some solution to something or contribute to solution at least if you start thinking on those lines you will do a different a different kind of research you will invest sufficient time for your research you will invest sufficient time for building your skills it is important Having conversations with your colleagues, having discussions, how this can be done, how that can be done, what are the methods that can be used, these discussions will help. Okay, opportunities and challenges, again, evidence to support interdependence of sciences. There is growing evidence that more interdependence among the sciences is existing than the boundaries that you find. So we are, so far we are thinking that there are more boundaries, political science, sociology, social work, psychology, each one has a boundary. But if you start looking at research, the evidence is suggesting that more common knowledge, common body of knowledge that is existing. You can see the connections, intersectionality of that. So, and an interdependence. Why this interdependence? Because the problems are common. Can you separate the discipline at the problem level? Let's say one, one, one problem at a community level or a human level. Can you separate the disciplines at that level? You cannot. The problems don't have the uh, boundaries, disciplinary boundaries. Whereas 
disciplines have the boundaries. But when you want to solve the problem, what is the approach that you need to adopt? They need to work together to solve the problem because they don't, there is no boundary. Disciplinary boundaries do not exist at the problem level, whether it's a human problem or a societal problem or any. Therefore, sciences have to come together to solve the problem. So why, why do we need sciences? To address the problems and the problems of the society and the human. Otherwise, what is the purpose of the knowledge? The purpose of the knowledge and research is to contribute to society or help people, help communities and global and other challenges. So therefore, interdependency is existing because the problems are common. Problems do not have the boundaries. More reliable and accurate measurement is needed in social sciences because one of the challenges that we face is uh, we do qualitative research, my research is qualitative. And there was a time where uh, social sciences are not properly treated because we don't measure them. Right? They are all qualitative, so social sciences are not valid research. They don't respect the research. There are quantitative researchers, even within uh, social sciences, they are disrespected social sciences. It was in the past. But even if someone is thinking on those lines today, that is not correct. At a global level, that is not correct. Social sciences also have to come to a point where they are trying to measure where they can, where it is possible. And they, they are doing qualitative research, the problems that do not allow quantitative research. So it is more realistic application of the methods to the human problems or societal problems where you have to use one approach is better than the other, you use it. So, your research questions or the hypothesis will decide which method you will use. Because you want to find a solution to that problem or do something or produce some knowledge that can solve the problem. So, your research questions will decide what methodology you will be using, not the other way around. Okay, so accurate measurement, if you need to have a measure or a, some kind of some, you can produce a scale to measure some phenomena, do it. If it, if it is not possible, qualitative. And now we are also using mixed methods. Sometimes you need to have both to assess the problem or address the problem, understand the problem better, both qualitative and quantitative. So in the US research, the mixed methods are also being used, both qualitative and quantitative. And in the, our, some of our funding agencies, previously they only focused on quantitative. Now they change their approach. They are funding mixed proposals. They are funding qualitative research. They are funding social science research. They are interdisciplinary research and also community-based research. There is a shift in how they fund because they have they have seen a lot of research in a conventional way and they are not able to see any improvement in the health and other areas. So they are encouraging more interdisciplinary research, community-based research, qualitative and quantitative. Approaches are changing. So then the last point is to integrate, opportunity to integrate the sciences. So it is not disintegration. Since the problems are common, so the more integration of sciences is happening more integration. But we are seeing those initial trends, but more will happen in future. More social scientists will be asked to be part of the studies. Even in India, not today, if it is not happening today, in India, it will happen tomorrow. Because always, you know, we need a, a 15 to 20 years gap to follow something from the US or other countries. So when they have done something and then, then we slowly start following it or importing some knowledge. So we don't want to do it at the same time. If the US is doing something, let us, good, it's a good idea, let us start doing it right away. We are not doing it. It can happen only when we exchange the ideas. So in a real time, whenever we can have a project in India, one another, uh, the same project can be implemented in the US. So we are 
jointly working and collecting the evidence and looking at the phenomena. What is working in India, what is working in the US, and how it is, what differences are there. We can compare the population, we can compare all that. So it will be more rigorous study and we will be able to find better solutions to the problems. But the collaboration is not happening now. One of my efforts is to build this, bring the researchers together from US and India so that we collaborate, we collaborate. So the, in sciences, typical sciences it is happening, but in social sciences it is not much happening. So therefore we need to come together to understand human and societal problems and collaborate and do research. And in that context what Professor Dinesh said is some of our scholars need to go from social sciences to do PhD or research studies, fellowships, to do in other countries. Because then you will understand the situation better. And you also have an exposure. And you try to approach research in a different point of view and integrate the knowledge. So integration needs to happen to find solutions and also to have a better world. So application of scientific methods in social and behavioral sciences. So we, we whatever the typical sciences have used some of this application, the application, producing the evidence and they're using it and doing research again, verification of the knowledge and trying to test the knowledge again and again. And what, so that you can produce a refined knowledge. More refined knowledge is more applicable, more useful to solve the problems. More refined knowledge. If you have a raw knowledge, it may or may not be really useful to find the solutions. You have to refine the knowledge, keep on refining. Sometimes the knowledge gets outdated and you can't use it. If there is a gap, that's what will happen. Going beyond quantitative versus qualitative discussion. So there was a competition between qualitative versus quantitative. But that controversy is gone now. Which is superior, which is the better, which are better methods. And that discussion in the US is over. If it is happening still in India, so we are lagging there. <laughs> that discussion is over now in the US. And more integrative approaches to conduct research is happening. And more rigorous secondary research. We used to think literature review and then writing some few articles we review and then write something out of it. That's not the case. In a secondary research, there are standards that are increasing. I'm not talking about the uh, data mining, uh, the large data studies. I'm talking about secondary research, the published work already. And trying to do analysis of that. There are rigorous approaches that are available now and also there are some softwares that are uh, developed which can be used to do research, more rigorous secondary research. If you don't have time to collect the data, you don't have resources, money, funding available, you don't have a fellowship, but turn to data bases, large data bases, and again, you can do good research when you use a large databases. You are just using the available data, longitudinal data, to analyze and test your research questions. Okay. And a month, this, uh, in the social sciences, mostly descriptive research to correlational. These are the where the most of the research is happening. But you can upgrade your research to quasi experimental. You don't have a control group, but that, that's fine. But you can have a comparison group. You can have a baseline. So you can, you, there are ways to do it. And you need to learn how, what are the methods that can be used to upgrade, upscale your uh, research standards. So research standards are important to improve social sciences and their application to human and societal problems. So you can do experimental research. I was thinking that when I started my career, the experimental research is not possible in social sciences, in a social disciplines. And now I am fully convinced and I have designed experimental design, experimental research as well. I have gone full cycle, the survey research to experimental research. I have designed and I implemented some, some of our studies. And I am part of the collaboration, collaboration interdisciplinary studies. So as a social science researcher, I am participating in experimental research. 
which we think is not possible, but that's no longer valid. So moving up, you know, improving the standards and improving your own skills. But what happened to me in this process? I am a completely transformed researcher. When I did surveys for my MPIL, to now, I am a transformed researcher. I have a wide range of tools in my box. So I can use where whatever I need to use and whatever the research problem that I have at hand. So these are the rare opportunities. So only it is possible when you are motivated to learn, improve your skills, you want to transform yourself. So anybody coming to me for the design, if you come with a research question, I can tell you and advise you, guide you what kind of design is more suited, where you can do good quality research. Okay. Sometimes I, I review some PhD thesis that come to US, so they send to me from other universities and I see not a very good quality research. It could have done, it could have been better if the scholars know some of the things. So that is where you know you have to learn, you have to have the motivation to learn and really methods and uh, your subject so that you can conduct good research. Why? One, make yourself better, better research. Two, to make better contributions. One day you should be known for what you do. And research now we are going to in the direction of multi-site. It is not one study at one place but one study at a multiple sites, multiple places. How that is possible? Collaboration. Collaboration. And there are studies with the, 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 we, we have a, a research mechanism called RO1, research at the highest level, where we have multiple lines of research within that topic, multiple lines of research within that topic. And a few PhD scholars, research scholars, or postdoctoral scholars will be working under the principal investigator, and each one will be working on one line of research. And what happens? You produce so much of knowledge by the time you complete one study, you have 10, 15 articles. So much of data. And move from one level to another level. What happens is you are trying to find a solution to the problem, one aspect of the problem, you cannot have a lot more components in that. So you are creating it as a separate line of research and then assigning to one more student, another student. So as a, as a researcher who is working for a long time, so you are investigating all related dimensions of the problem. By creating separate lines of research, assigning it to two, three PhD scholars. So it's a one project, umbrella project, and you have multiple lines of research, multiple scholars working, under the guidance of, but you are exploring two, more than two dimensions of the problem, how to address that problem. And it's happening in the, the natural sciences, even social sciences we started doing it. Collaboration at that level. And we are collaborating at multiple levels. Now going global. Now going global, you can have a site uh, outside the country. So what is happening here research, social science research is transforming itself. Global outreach. And where the opportunities are being uh, explored, more and more opportunities are available now. And it is no longer social science is less valuable. More valuable. And to me as a researcher, Social science is the promise for human progress, the future. Social science, without social sciences, the existing problems cannot be addressed fully. That's my assessment as an academic, academic for the years. Without social sciences, some of the problems cannot be addressed, cannot be resolved. So, role of social science is tremendous, very prominent. 
If anybody is thinking on those lines, they have failed. They have failed in their argument that only medical science or the typical science can address the problems. Look at the climate, look at the health issues, look at other problems, poverty. Poverty has, even in the US you have poverty. Why people have failed to address the problems? They are not engaging social sciences for. Then they don't have good understanding of the problems. They come up with the policies without understanding the problem. Do you see that? They don't have good understanding of the problem, human uh, conditions, and they come up with the policies. What will happen? The policies and programs will fail. They will not give the results that you want. So actually, when you are making the policies in the parliament or assemblies, they should invite the academicians, provide the input on that problem and issue. In the US, it happens. They invite the experts to provide their input on that, on the policies. Not the politicians. Academic experts, researchers, they identify, they, they ask the people, they have the staff, identify somebody who is expert in this area, two, three people. Ask them to appear before the committee and share their perspective. They do that. Here nobody asks, nobody cares for social science academy. Because they need to ask the input for that. So that you can make right policies and when you make the right policy, it can be implemented so that there will be impact on the public in the, in the society. Also, we should need to demonstrate that. Other thing is social sciences and other sciences have demonstrated how powerful is the science. And we need to, through our contribution, we need to demonstrate how powerful is the science, body of knowledge. So that they will listen to us. It's a both ways. And big data research and longitudinal research, I already talked about it. So, as I mentioned, interdisciplinary research efforts have continued to grow and they will grow in future also. So, integration of knowledge from multiple disciplines can occur within the uh, mind of single person and through the collaborative efforts of the knowledge team. So, I'll, with that, I'll skip this slide. Okay, so one uh, example is with the advent of big data. Occupational science statisticians are increasingly included in every project. And social scientists are inclu included in every medical science project. Social workers are part of most of the health projects that we are developing. Because social workers provide services to patients and mental, both uh, general health and mental health patients. They are increasingly being included. And public health professionals are being included. Even sociologists, a lot of sociologists are also part of this. If they have a discipline specialization, and not necessarily specialization, but they have a research agenda that deals with the health, and they are included. We have, we, have, we, we have a couple of researchers who are focusing on social determinants. We are part of the team. A sociologist and psychologist, we are part of the team. Along with the medical, uh, medical doctors. So we are working together to, on some of the health issues, health challenges including statistics. So, what are the rigorous standards that we need to use? Rigorous standards through institutional review board. In the US, there is a legislation that says every institution that is conducting research should have set up a committee, a board that will review the research applications. You cannot conduct the research without approval. As a faculty or as a student, if you do without approval, you, you, you are likely to lose your job. On that single note, you, you will lose your faculty job and students will be dismissed. You cannot do research without institutional approval. So the, they are called IRB. IRB. So even Ram, when he came for his research, he has to go through, through the application. And a student research is mostly faculty researcher has to be on the application. The guide has to be on the application. Student can submit, but guide is required. So following the standards is very much required. So you have to produce rigorous science, knowledge 
and it should be coherent. So regulation of intellectual property is also very important. Because something, application that you go through, people institution knows that you are conducting research, they know what kind of research you are doing. If somebody else submits the same proposal, then that is not going to work because you cannot cheat and it goes under violation of intellectual property. And also in the US, commercialization. So a lot of research, you know, in a, uh, which is very useful, very meaningful research and also innovations that are done and they may not see any light that they are after, okay? But in the US, if some research has produced very, very new inventions, uh, something, and they try to commercialize that, bring out a product and that can go into commercialization. So where it can generate revenue on an ongoing basis. We call it a commercialization of the intellectual property that is produced by the faculty. Include There are some students who have uh, what we call them intellectual property recognized by them. So by the uh, at a national level and they have intellectual property rights over those uh, discoveries and they get the revenue of it, a share of it. There is a percentage that is distributed and the agreement that is signed at the beginning when once they have determined that this is a useful thing that they can bring out a product and they bring the companies. So there is some kind of process that is used to commercialize the problem. And a researcher who has done that work gets the credit. And when before you do the application, IRB application, you have to go through a training module. Training modules to conduct ethical research, responsible research. There are different modules and you have to get at least 80 percent in that in those modules to be qualified you have to enclose your certification completion certificate of completion of these modules before when you make the application so there are standards that are regulation standards that are enforced from time to time they revise these modules my certification is valid only for three years. After three years, if there are any revisions made, then again I have to retake the test. It is not lifetime. Okay. So this applies to faculty, students, or any researcher, any kind of research. Even sometimes in hospitals, they have their own review boards. And both review boards have, if they, I'm working with a hospital and uh, some collaborators in a hospital. So the the hospital review board will look at the application, our board will look at the application. So whichever is final approved and then we share the approval and also so that you know we can really have approvals in place before we do the research. For a patient research, always there are rigorous procedures. Okay. Responsible conduct of research is defined a practice of scientific investigation with integrity. So you have to follow some rules and regulations, ethics. So research is ethical practice. So you have to have a good uh, uh, integrity in order to do research. It involves awareness and application of established professional norms, ethical principles in performance of all research activities. According to document responsible conduct in a global research enterprise, a policy report is produced, researchers should resist from speaking and writing with authority of science or scholarship on complex and unresolved <laughs> topics outside their areas of expertise. If someone is claiming that I have expertise, all expertise, beyond their knowledge or the areas of expertise, and that is not ethical conduct. So you have to admit that my research study has such and such limitations I have conducted, these are my findings. So with respectfully, even when you publish article also, you have to admit what are the limitations of your research. So you cannot just publish, okay, uh, you have only 10 cases, 10 patients, or 10 clients, or 10 respondents who provided the information, then you generate to the whole population, one, one, one billion population. So it is not. Sometimes, you know, generalizations that they are making, researchers are making, very sweeping. Because they will have limited data. And also the data comes from one particular segment of the population. And you cannot generalize to the entire population. You have to admit in your report or published article saying that this 
sample comes from such and such, and it, the, the study has such limitations. That is a responsible conduct of the research. So researchers risk their credibility by becoming advocates for public policy beyond your expertise. Okay. So these are the goals of RCA, RCA in the sense in our responsible conduct of research, uh, develop and foster maintain culture of integrity in science, discourage and prevent unethical conduct, empower researchers to hold themselves accountable, increase the knowledge, improve the ability to make responsible choices, provide appreciation for the change of accepted scientific practices, inform the scientists and research trainees, and promote career-long positive attitude toward research ethics and responsible conduct of research. So these are the guidelines what they want to accomplish by doing, enforcing these standards or a responsible conduct of research is this. So one of the aspects as a scholar you need to know is what is the ethical and the responsible conduct of research? It's very important. Even when you are writing, you have to give proper credit to the researchers who have published articles that you are using. Citations are very important. And it goes under plagiarism in the US. If any student, you know, indulged in a plagiarism, and they can be suspended from the program completely. And in smaller instances, we tell them how to cite and how to do it. We teach them there are conducts of our APA styles of writing we follow. So in social work and each discipline in literature, there is another style. So you need to follow your own discipline, what are the standards of writing that are accepted. The future directions, probably this is the last one. Um, more integrated research will be happening. That's what I'm seeing based on my experience and what I have seen so far to social and human problems. If that is not happening, those societies will not be that effective. Okay? The measures and the, anything that you are doing to solve the address the human problems, they will not be effective unless you move in the direction of integration. More integration, more and more integration can really help the societies solve the problems human and social, developing more rigor in social and behavioral research. We have to develop the new methods, new techniques, and modifying the strategies that you use in conducting research. Application of biomarkers would happen more and more in social science research as well. Because now, social science research has contributed, but what difference it will make? Because functional MRI has helped us to understand cognitive science so much. So if somebody is reading a book, it will help you in say. Now, we will see which part of the brain is being activated and what is happening there and by with the help of the biomarkers. You can map, take a map of the brain, what is going on whenever you are providing intervention and you can find out what, whether it is helping or not helping. When, when a person is engaged in an activity, the brain circulation, the blood circulation is higher, more. And there are pathways. So some parts of the brain are getting activated when you do an activity. So we are able to pinpoint how a particular intervention is um, influencing the brain and the personal outcomes. So more of these biomarkers, knowledge of bio, biology and other medical science advances will be used by social scientists. That's what I am seeing. Because that will add rigor to social science research. Even if you use one or two tools in your research, and it will add rigor, because you are using both the uh, um, sociological, uh, behavioral concepts as well as biomarkers, or existing data you may use it. So it will increase the validity of the social science research. Like natural sciences, more interdisciplinary international collaborations are needed. Natural sciences, they have collaborations, international collaborations. Social sciences also, more collaborations are needed, that's what I mentioned earlier. More engagement to address social and human problems in a real-time manner. But in the US, one trend that is happening is, see, when you produce the knowledge and take it to the real world to solve the human problems, it is taking almost 10 to 12 to 15 years. 
this is a roughly estimated time. So from knowledge of production to for use to application, it is taking almost 12 to 15 years. And in the meantime, the knowledge becomes outdated. The human problems will change. Our environmental problem, our environment will change. So what happens, the knowledge that is produced is not really usable after 15 years. So now the trend is they are pushing for more community-based research where we use action, participatory action research. For, for the, one of the proposals that I collaborated with uh, our medical science people is uh, community-based participatory research to address diabetes. <coughs> okay, we are using biomarkers, we are using social science and community-based approach. It's a lot of, it's a complex project. We have about 12 researchers who are part of this project, thing, all from all different disciplines. So it is a clear demonstration of social sciences, contribution and the value of uh, social sciences, where the others are recognizing and how we can make a, a contribution. And my uh, I community-based practices, I, I work in the communities, I have the community practice experience and uh, skills, how to implement a project at a community level and how to build the systems and how to bring people, engage the stakeholders, dissemination of information, all that I have worked. So, I can contribute because the medical experts and all that, they, they are not so much into the community working with the people and all that. We bring that knowledge. So, what kind of role we play? A very important role we play in, a pro in, in the implementation of the project, community-based project. Okay. So, if, and more and more community-based research is required in, a, in a India and in a, in a globally also. Because to address the problems, that is the direction we need to go. And society, so, societies cannot afford to invest a lot of money and wait for the results. You need to find a solution right away. What, bring all things together and let us well solve the problem. That's what is needed. Problems cannot wait. People's lives cannot wait. Understand? There is an urgency to address the problems and how you can bring the sciences together and address the problems. So which is called for community-based, more applied research and all sciences are working together to address the problems. So more interdisciplinary evidence-based. And I want to highlight this piece, underscore that, evidence-based. So once you apply the science to address the problem, you have to gather the evidence, okay? After gathering the evidence, then you have to analyze it and see how you have improved and what, where you have failed to improve, failed to change the things. So that analysis will tell us where we are successful, where we are not successful, where our interventions are effective, where our interventions are not effective, and what should be done in next round next round of implementation. Barely our people never reflect on what is the evidence coming and what needs to be changed. Sometimes we are continuing with the same program, same approach, same input, again and again, whether it is without assessing the outcomes. So it's a huge waste of money, societal resources, and also the lives of the people, they are suffering. One side you are investing the money and then that is, you are not getting good returns on that. Second, people are going through the suffering. If you do things in a right manner and with the science, use the science appropriately and improve and learn from what you are doing, you can solve the problem. Since you are failing to solve the problem, people are suffering. And ethical responsibility for social scientists and others. If you are neglecting the problem, not doing a good job of as a scientist, so you are not performing your job ethically. Nobody will come and ask you, but you ask the question, why did I do this? Why can't I do this? So asking those questions, am I ethical in my research? Am I doing what I am supposed to do? If you start asking those questions, you will be ethical. You, you are evaluating your own self. Okay?
That's all.